咁多位早晨。歡迎來到何地方全人治療年度研討會。我係 Amy， 我同 Phyllis 係大家今日嘅司儀。In memory of Mr. Daniel D. B. Ho, his family has launched this lecture and workshop series in holistic therapy with Center on Behavioral Health, the University of Hong Kong, since 2012. The aim of the lecture series and professional trainings is to enhance the understanding of holistic therapy among the general public and human service professionals. Especially its value in promoting mind body balance as a complement to conventional medicine. Since the launch of our project, the campaign has held nine public lectures, 11 professional training courses, and a symposium, attracting over 2,000 people to come. 為咗紀念何立邦先生，亦都承蒙其他人嘅慷慨捐助，香港大學行為健康教練中心於二零一二至二零一三年間推行咗一系列免費嘅公開講座同工作坊，目的係希望透過呢一系列嘅公開講座、工作坊同專業培訓，加強醫護界、社福界同教育界人士以及公眾人士對全人,全人治療嘅認識。亦都希望藉此建立一個經驗交流嘅平台，令到參加者可以了解到全人治療手法能夠促進身心平衡，亦都對傳統醫學有補足作用。由二零一二年年頭開始，我哋已經舉行咗十一場專業培訓工作坊、九場公開講座同埋一場研討會，累積嘅參與人數已經超過二千人。Before the start of the symposium, may we first invite Ms. Sylvia Ho, the eldest daughter of Mr. Danny D. B. Ho, to represent her family to deliver a speech. Ms. Ho, please. Thank you very much, Ms. Poe. Now, 
may we invite Dr. Ray Mahal, Director of the Center on Behavioral Health, to say a few words to us, please. Dr. Ray. 如果上校小姐，現在有請香港大學營養健康大研中心總監何天紅博士為我哋致辭，有請何博士。
both of which have their use, of course. But I will add to that another option, and that is to create. My goal today is to offer you some ways to think about the creative process. As you all know, there is ample evidence that, that the act of creating can be healing. But there are also times when the expressive arts therapists, such as myself, get frustrated by ways in which creativity gets stymied and people get stuck. Why can't I help this person? Sometimes I think that and I say, I'm providing a safe space for this person to create, to make art, to make poetry, to, to dance, but it just isn't happening. Why, what can we do to help understand that? I propose that we examine the creative process more closely so that we can begin to understand when it becomes most vulnerable to blockages and how we might better be able to nurture and sustain it. I don't really have answers, but I do have concepts and theories that I've been working on for some time. And I'll present them to you as a possible lens through which we can all apply our creativity to begin to ask meaningful questions that might lead to some useful solutions. The archetype of the mandala is the concept I will be using throughout this presentation. Mandala is an ancient Hindi word derived from the San Sanskrit, which literally means circle. Manda means container, and la means essence, the essence of the container. In many cultures from the beginning of time, the circular form has been a symbol for unity or the completion of the cycle. Dr. Carl Jung considered the mandala to be an archetypal symbol residing in the collective unconscious. I'll be speaking more on that later. The basic structures for this talk are three simple shapes. Angelus Arian synthesized all the various meanings and come up with a distilled version that I rather like. Um, the circle represents wholeness and the experience of unity. The square signifies stability, security, and a sense of responsibility. The equidistant cross is a universal symbol of integration, relationship, and balanced connection. When these three shapes are configured in various ways, the result is called a quadrated mandala. It's about making sense of the world. We're trying to see the whole picture. Employing this form helps identify and honor the center, establish the four directions, and square the circle, which is a way to integrate opposites, such as masculine and feminine, spirit and matter, lightness and darkness, conscious and unconscious. The quadrated mandala is the basic structure and lens for viewing my theory of creativity. I'll begin by telling you a story about myself as a young child, maybe eight or nine years of age, I grew up in a rural area about three miles from the Atlantic Ocean. My family lived on 15 acres of farmland. And one of my favorite places to be when I had free time was on a square raft-like construction, one, one and a half by one and a half meters perhaps, that leaned up against a tree. I have no idea where this came from, but there it was, and I made use of it. It, it overlooked a large field that was often planted with wheat, and was edged on three sides by the forest. When the wind blew through the grasses, it reminded me of the rhythmic swaying of the sea, and the sound of the breeze rustling through the trees it sounded like waves. On that square raft, I was the captain of my little vessel, and I imagine I was on the ocean exploring the world, seeing the horizon as it meets the vastness of the sky, feeling the comfort of the sun's warmth. I would consider the directions, so I would know how to orient myself. I knew I was facing west, because that was the direction of the setting sun. I especially loved to be out there at dusk, to catch the vermilion glow that settled the day, and sometimes an early glimpse of the rising moon in the east. I remember how completely blissful I would feel when the moon was full. It brought for me a deep longing, though for what, I did not know. Reflecting on my experience helps me to appreciate what it must have been like for the first humans on our planet. 
There was a clear delineation between the dome of the sky, world above, and the earth plane below. And we can assume that the earth was envisioned as round. If you've ever looked out at the ocean or open fields as far as you can see, do you remember how the horizon line looks slightly curved? The people got their warmth from the, and light from the round sun, so that was a powerful force in their lives that elicited respect. Throughout most of recorded history of peoples across the world, there are multiple references to sun worship and actually naming solar de deities, which has been the basis of many sacred myths and rituals. The Paleolithic sun wheels, created some 25,000 years ago on the face of rocks, are the earliest examples of Mandala art. This is just a, a sketch of what they would look, would look like. Many of these simple circles were quadrated, and this makes sense. Primitive people found themselves in a circular and cyclical world, and to distinguish where they were in space, they would need to establish directionality so as not to get lost and to define their position. Within the first straight line, lines that got drawn from the central point, uh, that often symbolized the sun, these lines represented the four directions, or the four seasons, or the four lunar cycles, and back when four was believed to be the terminal number, uh, the four continents, the four elements, the four colors. This motif is repeated over and over again in just about every culture to represent the world of humans and the world of gods, and how people try to emulate here on Earth the perfection of nature and the sacred order of things. Some have argued that the monoliths that are so prevalent in the East actually derive from the bronze mirrors of the Han Dynasty. These little discs hung, hung in ritual temples to designate the cosmic axis. The quadrated circle of the Han mirror has been defined as a diagram of the universe, shaped in the image of the cosmos, round above the sky and square below the Earth. Here I think of my little self on that square raft looking up on the round sky, and somehow I connect to these ancient times. The four seasons and cardinal points, as well as the four seas, were designated on the Han mirror. The rhythmic order of the universe was embodied and preserved over disorder. Similar to other myths regarding the squared circle, order and rationality come from above, the masculine world, and consciousness, that's the vertical trajectory, and darkness, chaos, and abundance come from the feminine earth, the horizontal. All this surrounded the central point in the circle where both lines intersected, which would be the exact center where the directional lines crossed. In an ancient Chinese text, Chao Li said of the center, there heaven and earth are united, there the four seasons are at one, there the yin and yang are in harmony. The center point, or the axis mundi, which is Latin for the world axis, symbolizes the connection between Earth and the sky, and the path for communication between upper and lower realms. It is like the umphalus, or umbilical of the world, the point of creation. Different cultures represent the sacred center by various forms, such as a sacred mountain. Think of Mount Kwanlun in China, Mount Fuji in Japan, Mount Zion for the ancient Hebrews, Mount Olympus in Greek mythology. Also, sacred trees, the tree of life for the path to enlightenment, the Bodhi tree. Pyramids, maypoles, totem poles, stupas, pagodas, minarets, steeples, centers of domes, central altars, shrines, all symbolize the axis mundi and humans' desire for connection to the other world. These are just a few of numerous examples from cultures world. Primitive humans saw the regularity and predictability of the movement of the universe and the rhythmic comings and goings of the sun, moon, and stars, and the seasons. Karahunge in Armenia and Stonehenge in England are two of the earliest examples of what we believe to be stone circle constructions used as sacred ceremonial centers for solar and lunar calendars as well as tracking astronomical happenings. El Castilla at Chichen Itza in the Yucatan in Mexico was built as a temple by the Mayans and was also used as a solar calendar. All of these early structures were oriented according to the directions with a sense of the center as a central, a central to the whole cosmic system. 
balanced geometric designs and architecture reflect the harmony and perfection of the sacred. The combination of the circle symbolizing spirit or heaven and the square symbolizing matter or earth is a metaphor, metaphor for balancing all opposites. Hagia Sophia, a fine example of Byzantine architecture, is one. Uh, the four minarets were added later when it became a mosque. And Chartres Cathedral, an excellent example of Gothic, both focused on the mandala form as a symbol of the perfection of God, incorporating both the equilateral cross and the dome with perfect proportions. A wonderful example of, of Islamic architecture, the Blue Mosque, incorporates the square and circular forms as an expression of divine unity. The dome ceilings that cast light through many windows for visual aids, used for achieving harmony with God, as were the rose windows in early Christian cathedrals. The story of creation is said to be encoded in some ancient structures in the East, such as the Buddhist temple of Borobudur in, in Java, Indonesia. Circumambulating the five square levels and four circular terraces to the top, is a sacred path to the center, symbolizing a journey to the source of creation. There are further examples in China, India, Cambodia, Thailand, of both Hindu and Buddhist temples that reflect a journey towards enlightenment. This ninth century minaret of a mosque in Iraq was thought of as a spiral ascent towards God, symbolic of the expansion and evolution of consciousness when approaching spiritual realms. The concept of being on such a journey is also exemplified by walking the labyrinth, known as a substitute for the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. The classic labyrinth design at chart shows the four directions embedded in the circular design. Some of the most beautiful quadrated monuments are Asian, those used for Buddhist ritual prayer meditations, painted on silk cloth or made with colored sand, are considered a facilitator for integration of opposites and the ultimate path towards harmony and enlightenment. A tantric Hindu mandala, the Sri Yantra, is also used for sacred meditation, inscribed with a seed mantra and created during complex rituals. It becomes the object of devotion and is believed to contain thought and sound energy patterns that enhance connection to the metaphysical realm. Mandalas were also used for medicine. Some diagrams have been found from ancient China that were designed for medicine ceremonies and were believed to be used for meditation and healing rituals. Uh, similar to these Navajo sand paintings of the American Southwest, still being used today. And both were based on the circular design with four directional gates. As we have seen by these few examples of quadrated mandala art and architecture spanning thousands of years, and numerous cultures and religions, the use of this symbolic form has provided the following. An understanding of space, time, and movement in the world, an honoring of the principle of order, an expression of duality and a balancing of opposites, a protected place for sacred ritual and ceremony, a means to achieve healing or transformation, a path pilgrimage or journey towards enlightenment, a longing for wholeness or for a sense of unity. The act of creating can also potentially fulfill these objectives. You may be wondering why I spent all this time reviewing the ideology of the quadrated circle, besides the fact that I love to show art historical images. I have an undergraduate degree in art history. Uh, but here's the real reason. I found that the splendid archetype provides a perfect blueprint for understanding life and states of being. So that has been the object of my study for some time. John Weir Perry says, when archaic man saw his cosmos in terms of a sky world, an underworld, and his own plane, all structured around an axial center and bounded by a periphery, he was delineating at one and the same time the contours of his myth world, the ritual staging of it, and the configuration of his own psyche. The mandala is a configuration of a person's psyche. Let's think about that. Well, of course, the circle is a form to which we are exposed from our earliest memory. The placenta is a circular shape, the seventh mother's breast, mother's face, mother's eyes, a baby's first reflection of his or her own face. 
The circle's the first shape that a child consciously draws after random kinesthetic scribbling. The circle becomes the construct for the self. The Swiss psychiatrist Dr. Paul Jung thought of the mandala as an archetype residing in the collective unconscious to which all humankind has access. Jung called archetypes primordial images that did not come from personal experience, but rather from a collective shared with all cultures throughout time. These images symbolize our instincts and emotions and often come to us through the dream world or active imagination or through creativity. After years of researching the psyches of his patients, as well as his own psyche, which now, after a century, is finally available to us in the Red Book, he concluded that the mandala is the quintessential archetype for the transcendent self that is striving for wholeness throughout the process of individuation. Jung considered the ego to be part of consciousness. The self, with the capital S, he saw as residing in the entire psyche, and the process of individuation, he claimed, requires a dialogue between the unconscious and the unconscious, trying to integrate dichotomous aspects to achieve wholeness. I like this quote by Dr. Stanislav Brock, that trying to explain um, Carl Jung's concept of individuation. He says, in the individuation process, humans can transcend the narrow boundaries of the ego and the personal unconscious and connect with the self that is commensurate with all humanity and the entire cosmos. Unlike Freud, who taught human develop, thought human development was determined by the time a person became a young adult, Jung believed that people could continue to evolve throughout their lifespans. He talked about four stages of development, childhood, youth, middle age, and old age. Eric Erickson expanded upon that to include eight stages of psychosocial development, that start at infancy and end at old age, each with opportunities to further grow psychologically. Jung and Erickson were both holistic in their approach to health and well-being. They believed in self-actualization that is possible through integration and balance and attention to the conscious and unconscious. Developmental theories that are holistic in nature can be thought of as circular rather than linear. Art therapist Joan Kellogg studied the work of Carl Jung and, like him, became interested in mandalas and the multicultural myths and symbols in the collective unconscious. Involved in the seminal study of states of consciousness with Stanislav Grof and Helen Bonney, Kellogg subsequently integrated prenatal, that is before birth, and transpersonal after death theories of personality development with the traditional life cycle theories that just went from birth to death. She increased the developmental stages to 12. She created a circular construct for the life cycle that she called the archetypal stages of the great round of mandala. Putting developmental stages in a round format is not a new idea at that time. Her ability to determine the placement of archetypal forms to represent her stages of the life cycle was her genius. I first met Joan Kellogg in 1979, and soon thereafter she became my mentor. Her model has been the inspiration for much of my work as an art therapist. Her theory is a complex one that I've been teaching for over 25 years, so today I can't possibly give it justice in the short time we have. However, when we talk again about the life cycle, I will try to give you the general gist of Kellogg's great round, since her theory has been the springboard for my working hypotheses in the holistic round of formation. Now that you have all the basic ingredients, I can introduce you to the holistic round of formation by synthesized and streamlined way of viewing states of being. I'll start with the skeletal model and add concepts incrementally. I've used this quadrated circle to make sense of cycles of creation and states of consciousness. I like to use the quadrated model for two reasons. First, the archetype carries with it a holistic view of life, as we have seen. And second, it consists of a model divided into four basic parts that I have discovered is applicable to most theoretical constructs. Let's first get a sense of the energetic lay of the land where this holistic ground lives. The way to appreciate energy states is to think of brain waves. At the very bottom, down here, um, is the deepest unconscious, that would be delta. Um, that, that would be deep, dreamless sleep. Moving upwards, we come to the theta, across here, which is a lighter form of sleep or deep relaxation. Then midway through the quadrated circle at the transitional places, from unconscious, 
unconscious is the alpha, which is a calm, relaxed, non-thinking, but very alert state that is ideal for meditation. And at the top of the round is beta, which is the um, very wide awake, normal thinking state in full consciousness. The center, the place of, for of formlessness, right here, um, cannot be defined in terms of states of consciousness. It embraces all of the states. It is the enso. It is the pleroma, or the divine fullness. The Tao, or the energetic source of everything, the provider of chi. It is the axis mundi that we have already discussed. And it is probably the most essential concept related to creativity. It is best described by this verse in the Hoi Ming Ching, the Book of Consciousness and Life, in the secret of the golden flower. Without beginning, without end, without past, without future, a halo of light surrounds the world of the law. We forget one another, quiet and pure, altogether powerful and empty. The emptiness is irradiated by the light of the heart and of heaven. The water of the sea is smooth and mirrors the moon in its surface. The clouds disappear in blue space. The mountain will shine clear. Consciousness reverts to contemplation. The moon disk rests alone. The poet T.S. Eliot captures the state of formlessness in this excerpt from Burnt Morton. At the still point of the turning world, neither flesh nor fleshless, neither from nor towards, at the still point, there the dance is. But neither arrest nor movement, and do not call it fixity, where past and future are gathered, neither movement from nor towards, neither ascent nor decline, except for the still point, there would be no dance, and there is only the dance. The center of formlessness is a sacred ground of all being, and the container for all that is possible. Think of form as something that comes into existence from the unconscious realm to consciousness. It could be a person in the life cycle, or maybe it could be a relationship. It could be an idea, a theory, or a creation. It could be a metaphor for just about anything, from evolution of society to just a day in one person's life. This diagram outlines the phases that are important in generating something into being bringing it into full consciousness, and then letting that being return to its source. Remember that the lower half of the circle represents the unconscious. All down here and up here is the consciousness. The idea of form exists in our dream world. True form doesn't happen until it is born. Right here. But all down here is available to the unconscious. It is born at the liminal space at those alpha levels between the unconscious and conscious. At the highest point of consciousness, up here, where it says full form, um, it's, the most, it's in its most com complete manifestation. And then eventually the form must die, to get back to the death of form. Um, and transition back to, to its beginning, to the unconscious again. And that's a cycle we all know. It helps to recall that this quadrated mandala is really three-dimensional. I have to keep reminding you, I remind myself, as we see it two-dimensionally. But the blue is conscious sky, and the green is unconscious earth. The red line illustrates how to imagine this model being divided into quadrants. The slight glow in the center represents the source. The quadrants have specific functions. In ancient times, humans knew the essence of each season and the importance of the solstices and equinoxes in terms of understanding their own cycles. These are photos of a field near my home that I've taken during the course of a year. It's delightful to witness the gradual changes of color and texture as the months go by. The winter, and the lower quadrant here, um, is a time of preparation. Snow gives the soil protection and nourishment, allowing it to rest. Roots or bulbs hibernate in the dark. Planting of the garden happens. New seeds are chosen. In springtime, plants break ground, seeking sunlight to grow. Seeds placed deep in the soil start to sprout. New plants are planted. 
they are tender and young, have energy to thrive and survive, even though unpredictable weather may present obstacles. The season of summer is for weeding and watering the garden, tending the plants into their full maturity in the sunlight. It is a time of harmony and acceptance. In autumn, there is a reaping of the harvest. What is left of the plants' decayed forms returns to nurture the earth. It is the end of the life of these plants for this cycle. It gets cold once again, and the cycle continues. Notice the transitional points of the equinox line. It is the transitional place between the unconscious and conscious. It's the equinox, the autumn equinox. Um, there's, it's equal. You know, there's not one, more of one than the other. Lightness and darkness are equally divided. Whereas the solstice line denotes the extremes of lightness, the longest day, the top, and the shortest day, the bottom, the winter, extremes of lightness and darkness. Looking back at this diagram, let's think about the life cycle as it relates to the holistic ground of formation. The winter quadrant of preparing is equivalent to the prenatal states of being. Here on the left. Um, the springtime of planting would parallel developmental states. The summertime of tending, maturational states, and the autumn quadrant of harvesting relates to the transpersonal states. The beauty of this life cycle is the fact that it can be applied to any cycle one might be going through. Please think of these states of being as metaphors for any cycle one might be experiencing. And whenever I show you one of these diagrams, remember that the direction of the energy starts at the center, and comes downward to the bottom, and then proceeds clockwise around the whole perfect. So that's going to be the trajectory of energy. I took some liberties and played with the word form, as you can see, to describe what occurs in each quadrant. As I review these words with you, I will also show you a chart that I made using graphics similar to what Kellogg chose for her archetypal stages of the Great Round, in which she conceptualized 13 stages, the 12 developmental stages, and stage 0 is in the center. I prefer to say states of being rather than stages. So this is my rendition of John Kellogg's archetypal stages of the Great Round. Formlessness in the center, at zero, means there never has been nor ever will be anything likened to form in the place of soul, the source of all being, the source of all energy for everything possible. My word for this place is longing. Energy descends from spirit to matter, from the sky realm to the earth plane, uh, to one, no form, as opposed to formlessness. On the earth plane, it means that there is no form, there is form potential at this point, but at this moment it's just, a, just at conception, and it's just a little dot, a point or a dot in the unconscious darkness. I've named the state attaching. This quadrant of prenatal, prenatal states, one, two, and three, um, is the part of the life cycle that Dr. Stanislav Brock studied. Right here. Um, he was a pioneer in the area of perinatal influences on personality. In the womb, the fetus is affected by all kinds of experiences. In the last 20 years, there's been much research in this particular area that substantiates Dr. Groff's hypotheses. The next two states are about the process of forming. Early on, things are beginning to take form, preforming it too. See all the little possibilities of uh, things that might happen. Uh, but there are many changes taking place. It reflects a time in utero when the cells of the fetus are dividing and multiplying. And I named it incubating. It is followed by three, which would correspond with the last trimester of pregnancy, a time of rapid growth and differentiation. At this forming phase, which I call focusing, the fetus is getting ready to spiral through the Earth's canal. There's a lot of spiraling energy here. Um, and be born at the transitional place between the conscious and unconscious realms. Or named beginning, is the birth of form, the place of infancy, when basic needs and nurturance are provided. The upward pointing triangle towards consciousness is contained and protected. Traditional life cycle theories usually start here. The quadrant developmentally parallels the years from birth to adolescence, these next stages, four, five, and six. Um, five is early childhood, when rules are introduced. 
The toddler's family, surroundings, and environment are informing him so he can learn how to be in the world. The child learns how to do things. Power struggles may ensue when boundaries and defenses represented by the repetition of lines are formed. I mean stripes. I call it the state of struggling. Six occurs during childhood and is renegotiated during adolescence. Uh, it is, I use the term confronting because it is about confronting the shadow aspects of self, dealing with polarities and balancing opposites. It is also a time of idealism and passion, heightened creativity, and sometimes rebellion. Adolescents may think of better ways of doing things and might get involved in trying to, or maybe just thinking about ways in which they could reform their world. The upper right maturational quadrant, seven, eight, and nine, up at the top, um, correlates with adulthood and has many challenges. At the very top of the great round is the state of young adulthood being in full form at seven. Here one is able to integrate previous dualities, is capable of abstract thinking, and is ready for responsibility and relationship. I have named this a state of integrating, reflecting the essence of the quadrating circle that symbolizes it. Eight is about being confident and competent in whatever career choice one has made. A single person is depicted by the five-pointed star. It is a time of performing, trying to do one's best in his or her line of work. I like to call this a state of committing to something in life. And then during mid-adulthood at nine, um, one realizes that conforming to society's rules and expectations is necessary to achieve one's goals. Interaction with others takes place with family, college, and society, wherein homeostasis is achieved. I call it a time of completing. Seeking meaning becomes significant as one sums up what one has done. As the geriatric psychiatrist Dr. Gene Cohen pointed out in his research on older adults, we take time in midlife to, to sum up. This state reflects a time of fulfillment of goals and a sense of harmony and perfection. Dr. Imoto's perfectly symmetrical crystals of water would represent this state very nicely. Next, there is old age, where energy slows down and death of form happens at 10, which I call ending. It is a time to acknowledge the end, along with feelings of separation and loss. This final transpersonal quadrant addresses the return to the unconscious. And going back down into the unconscious with feelings um, in indicated by the downward pointing triangle and all of its disorienting aspects. In an actual life cycle, 11 and 12 are transpersonal states of consciousness that could manifest beyond death, but they are metaphorically accessed in life during the deep times of transition and meditation. 11 causes a sense of losing form or deforming. I see it as a state of disintegrating, which can activate chaos, disorientation, and confusion. It would be illustrated well by Dr. Emoto's fragmented or asymmetric water crystals. <clears throat> and finally, 12 is the place of alchemical transformation. Kundalini experiences can happen along with a profound change of consciousness. It epitomizes epiphany, renewal, and rebirth. I think that this is the state of returning, time to return to the source once again, and thus the cycle goes on and on. To understand the broad potential of each stage, think of experiencing a particular state of being somewhere on a continuum from the least to most optimum way. As Joan Kellogg used to say, there is always a good side and a bad side to every town. <laughs> another thing to remember about this model is that there are six axes, two stages opposite one another, such as one and seven, and three and nine, three and nine, four and ten. Um, and each one indicates complementary or paradoxical dynamics. And I'll address this again when we get to the cycle of creativity. Back to the holistic ground information, another way to appreciate what this diagram can offer us is to consider how each quadrant carries the energy of a predominant function. Carl Jung's theory of uh, psychological types includes four fundamentally different ways that people experience the world. Sensation has to do with direct experience of the senses. What is there, is there. That's it. It's plain and simple. It exists. The winter quadrant of prenatal states where everything is in its preliminary state of being is a place where the function of sensation would likely live best. Feeling is mostly subjective and involves
involves what value and experience might have, good or bad, pleasant or unpleasant. The spring quadrant of developmental states, when everything exists in reaction to its environment, would engage the feeling function. Thinking is conceptual and objective. The summer quadrant of maturational states, all highly conscious and therefore cognitive driven, would logically employ thinking to determine the meaning of the experience, to distinguish it from other experiences. Intuition incorporates the implications of an experience. What might be possible with this information and where it came from? The autumn quadrant of transpersonal states, and where the, where the world doesn't make rational sense anymore, is a place where the function of intuition could most likely be encountered. And here's another visual reminder that this two-dimensional model is really three-dimensional. The feeling and thinking red and yellow functions in the conscious area of the realm, on the top, and the sensation and intuition, green and blue, are in the unconscious realm. So, um, I have four examples of four whole theories using the holistic ground of formation. The holistic ground of formation is designed to help us understand the basic path generally in four aspects or steps, which so many theorists have written about. Each theory has to follow the art, art seems to follow the archetypes of this holistic round. Although I have correlated this model with many theories, I've chosen just four to illustrate how it works. I apologize for what will seem like a very a simplification of very complex theories, but my purpose is to use them as examples, assuming most of you will be familiar with at least one of them, if not all. Jean Gebser, an important 20th century Swiss cultural philosopher, wrote brilliantly about multi-level structures of consciousness and the evolutionary ascent of hum the human psyche. Archaic consciousness relates to universal wisdom and is in potential, much like we've all said about all the things we've said about the axis mundi. Magical consciousness is one-dimensional and works on the basis of instinct and ritual. Mythical consciousness is two-dimensional and relates, relates to the psyche through imagination. Mental consciousness is three-dimensional and brings in rationality. And this is in full mature rational states. Integral consciousness brings in the fourth dimension of spiritual knowing and intuition. And as you can see, it fits perfectly in the quadrants that are laid out here. Gexer said, every manifestation of our lives inevitably contains the sum of the past as well as what is to come. Joseph Campbell, the renowned mythologist, wrote about the hero's adventure. He says, we have not even to risk the adventure alone, for the heroes of all time have gone before us. The labyrinth is thoroughly known. We have only to follow the thread of the hero's path, and where we had thought to find an abomination, we shall find a god, and where we had thought to slay another, we shall slay ourselves. Where we had thought to travel outward, we will come to the center of our own existence. And where we had thought to be alone, we will be with all the world. Unquote. Here's a succinct, in succinct form as a fourfold journey of the hero, or heroine. And since you now understand what each quadrant represents, I'm assuming you'll be able to see how each step of the journey, departure, venture forth on a quest, initiation, road of trials, Discovery, gift of self-knowledge, and return, application of gifts, relates to this whole holistic round of formation. As a segue into our discussion about creativity and health, let's take a look at my attempts to use this diagram to communicate the basic premise of Gong Shu's treatment modality, which he calls Yishu, the art of living with change. He's an expressive arts therapist who is an integrator of both Eastern and Western approaches to medicine. He says, quote, philosophically, Yichu follows the belief system of the holistic perspective and the spontaneity and creativity of Taoism. Unquote. I apologize if I'm pronouncing these terms incorrectly. Um, healing in this method of combining meditative practices and spontaneous creativity is all about balancing four fundamental aspects of the person, biological, psychological, social, and spiritual, so that there's a union of opposites, the yin and the yang, and an ultimate sense of harmony. The quadrated mandala, which symbolizes the entire psyche, can be the holistic container for these realms. Focusing on the four functions, you can see 
Why these four realms correlate so well with each quadrant? In my theory of creativity, I also believe these four areas that constitute the psyche are involved during the creative process, but in varying degrees depending on where one, there, one might be experiencing blockages. But first I want to share with you another person's thoughts on creativity. Rollo May, an existential and humanistic psychologist, wrote one of my favorite books on creativity, The Courage to Create, in which he addresses the notion of encounter. Again, I hope I've taught you this theory well enough so that you can see why each encounter works in each quadrant. Encounter is readiness, receptivity, and observation in the first quadrant. Encounter is absorption, engagement, commitment in that feeling quadrant. Encounter is interrelating, interrelating to the world in that uh, maturational state. Uh, summer quadrant, and encounter as an unconscious inspiration in the fourth, last quadrant of harvesting. Finally, as I have promised, <laughs> the holistic realm is a lens for exploring states of being through creativity. Here, once again, is the holistic realm of formation that I use as a blueprint for understanding states of being as as states of form coming into existence during the process of creating. Rather May said, the creative process is the expression of passion for form. It is a struggle against disintegration, the struggle to bring into existence new kinds of being that give harmony and integration. Before we begin, I want to remind you again, the direction of the energy starts at the center, comes downward to the bottom, and then proceeds clockwise around the circle. Here at last is my integrated theory regarding the states of being involved in the cycle of creativity. As I take you through each quadrant, please think about your approach to creativity. Is there one quadrant that is more meaningful to you than another? Do you recognize times when your creativity might get blocked? I make reference to the perspective of a visual artist, but it could be any type of artist, a musician, a dancer, a poet. Okay, so, at zero, longing to create. The creative impulse is here, where everything and anything is possible. In the dream world, one can feel close to the creative source. The potential to create is fueled by trust and faith, and inner knowing. This is the blank canvas, where there is paradoxically nothing and yet everything. It is the still point. Coming down to one, attaching to the idea of creating. Still, a deeply unconscious state, a seed is planted, it's something tangible, an idea perhaps, solid, with the trusting that it can survive and not be lost. One can begin to make connection with this creative urge, this life force, but one has to remain attached to the idea, to nurse it, to support it to keep it safe, lest it disappear. And note here the axis of, of one into seven. At seven, that, that's when there is full form, something has already been created. So it's a dream of making something concrete and integrative. At two, the incubating phase, uh, one is moving into a theta state of consciousness. The idea of creating something becomes more of a reality. The mind is flooded with possibilities. Remember that was all little dots and possible things that could happen. Like a passive viewer, one watches fleeting forms and colors emerging and receding. Sometimes there are actual images. The desire to create remains strong, and this is the place of inspiration and imagination. The senses are activated, and the memory of sights, sounds, and textures can filter into consciousness, leaving a distinct impression. Incubation phase of the creative process is what this is, and it's where one is to be open to all possibilities. And the opposite end of this is being, actually being an artist, you know, having completed this process. It's at three, uh, there's a focusing on, on an intention to create something. So it's become more, more than just sort of floating and you're unconscious about this and thinking, dreaming about it. There's a transition, transition now from Seda to Alpha, and there's a focused attention towards creating. The decision has been made. Energy mobilized mobilizes towards being engaged in the process of painting, drawing or sculpting or whatever. There's now an intention born out of the previous state of inspiration. And this is a strong 
place of arousal it can be sexual and or spiritual. It gets activated by the anticipation of the creative process. Something will be created. And the opposite end of that place, the spiral place, is stage, stage nine, which is when completing something. So there's a dream of finishing a project, visioning the process as completed. Now some people love to stay in this quadrant of possibilities and sensation without ever actually starting to create. I've been guilty of that myself. <laughs> there can be many plausible excuses, time or whatever, but the reality often is fear-based, fear of failure. Blockages um, can happen in that way. Blockages are much more obvious in the next quadrant when the creative process has begun. This is a tenuous time for creation. At four, beginning the project, awakening to from alpha consciousness to beta consciousness, but as an artist, we are maintaining the ability to drift in and out of those other the alpha and theta states. The creative project has begun here, which requires a lot of startup energy. It's the birthing place of form. The artist must pay attention to it and nurse it along if it's going to be creative. You've got to be able to survive. Um, look at the opposite end. The core is death of form. So I mean, it is, there's an awareness that if it's not nurturing, it could not, it just might not make it. At five, this is a place of struggling with limitations. The limitations of reality are evident. There are boundaries and restrictions that are imposed by the art materials, for instance. The size or texture or quality of the paper, the plasticity of the clay, the range of shades or tints among the available colors. All of this might not match the artist or accommodate his, his or her artistic vision. Or someone may try too hard to imitate reality and get frustrated over the impossibility of it. A power struggle can ensue. And this is a place where projects get broken down all the time in the uh, expressive arts therapy room. Um, the clay can get thrown back into its bin, the paper can be balled up and trashed, and the danger is falling into a place of uh, stage 11 where nothing, everything falls apart in chaos. But with enough creative insight, you can make it. At six, one confronts doubts and holds the tension. Very important place in the creative cycle, the place of holding the tension. And one of the, if you, one has been able to respect the inherent boundaries and limitations of the materials, then this is the next stage that's crucial to the survival of the art. It's essential. This place of tension is essential to any process of creativity. Rather than feeling constrained by the limitations of the materials, the artist confronts them. Perhaps take some rebellion takes place, the desire to do something innovative or different. It's like doing battle with a shadow, lots of eros energy, working towards a mission or a goal, having idealism, holding the tension of polarities. However, if one remains in conflict, not able to hold the tension to its climax, the creation might not make it. Now this is the, the creative acts of 6 to 12. 12 is the place of uh, represents the kundalini energy of the creative act where transformation can happen. Potential blockages in this next quadrant, seven, eight, nine, occur when the process is not carefully tended. Remember, this is the summer quadrant where tending is necessary. Or when it loses its arrows energy and becomes too cognitive. It's the thinking place. State at seven, integrating and balancing and preserving the creation is what's necessary. At this point, the artist knows it's working. There's balance, there's integration in the art, the artist is high and good about it, it's full of love for the art, a new sense of self-awareness. It's the high noon of the self, like the, like the summer solstice. It's a place of preserving the art, knowing it's a keeper. And you can step back and, and honestly analyze what is working and what is not working. Now the downfall here, the opposite end of seven, is one, um, where there's nothing, and one can, um, can crash here if not careful, to be overconfident in the success of the piece. At eight, committing to an identity as an artist. This is a place of confidence. Good choices have been made, the process is going well, the art is looking good. The artist is totally fulfilled by creating and could possibly nurture or mentor other, others in this process. And, and can look back on too, the place of incubation where it all began um, as a potential for more creations. At nine, complete in the creation and sharing it with others. Remember, this is the place where um, society and group is important. The finishing touches are made, the artwork is done, the artist can relax now and enjoy the fruit 
as our labors. Everything comes to full fruition. Uh, might even involve showing your artwork to others in an art show, feeling the praise of others from others for work well done, or being in a community of artists and, and knowing the place among them. But you can't stay here. The danger is stagnation. You need to keep things moving. So back to stage three, back in the state of consciousness of three, is a place where something new can be um, start generating again. At 10, it's the end of the creative experience. There's distance from the creative process. The products have been created, perhaps they were sold. Feelings previously experienced are difficult to remember. There's a sense of anxiety, possibly even despair, a sense of loss and separation, a going inward retreat, a search for renewal. It is the ending of a creative cycle. One could stay dormant for a while before inspiration happens again, but when something dies, one knows intuitively that um, something new can be born again on the opposite end to the axis. At 11, this is a place of disintegration, and this challenges creativity. It's a place of disorientation and powerlessness, confusion. Back in the unconscious realm, nothing makes sense anymore. It's irrational. You may be dreaming again, but it's not inspirational. It could be nightmarish or surreal or bizarre. Things are shaken up, often not able to create at this time. But it can also be a creative challenge, how to organize disorder into something meaningful. The trickster may be evident, and transformation is possible. Again, the uh, opposite end of 11 is 5, which is uh, where there are limitations and boundaries. So fear of being in the place of 11, of chaos, um, may be that one retreats to uh, 5, where there's some boundaries. But that may not be a way to regain one's creative spirit. So creativity can be blocked at 10 and 11 because these states have to do with endings and letting go. However, some artists are truly inspired by the pathos and chaos. At 12, it's returning to a place of inspiration, back to a place of full, full integration. There's a sense of renewal, the potential for transformation, restoration of trust in the process, a new alignment of the artist's ego, there may be an awareness of a higher power, it can be spiritual or intersexual ecstasy, peak experiences can occur here. Um, that will inspire great works of art. There's hope for the creative process to be reawakened again. And this is a place of intuitively knowing and appreciating the whole cycle of creativity. So 12, going back to 6, that is the creative place from inspiration to the tension of creating. Um, that is the creative, creative access. Now the center, the place of formlessness, going back to that, uh, Enzo in Zen Buddhist painting, for instance, it symbolizes when the mind is free to let creation flow. And that is really the sense of the Tao, the source of Chi. It, and it's accessed by the artist at some point during the creative cycle. It's not always in the beginning, and some, but at some point it, it happens. Inspiration to create can actually begin anywhere on the cycle. We just looked at an example of artists who felt a sense of loving and then went and started the process in the sensation quadrant. But some art artists actually start in the feeling quadrant. Uh, they make a decision to create something and let it emerge during the process of playing with the materials uh, without first honoring any unconscious motivation. That might come later. Others might start in the thinking quadrant. They may have in mind exactly what form they want to produce, so they practice and practice until they have gotten it exactly the way they had intended. Then there are those who begin in the intuitive quadrant, finding inspiration from the irrational aspects of the unconscious, perhaps trying to create order from disorder. Or those who are inspired in 12, the place of transformation, will generally proceed into the next quadrant to begin their process of creating. I contend. However, that no matter where one starts, each of the states of being uh, will be addressed during a successful creative process, some simultaneously. And all are necessary in their own way. And ignoring any of the states might ultimately contribute to an interruption in one's ability to bring the creative act to completion in a health engendering way. People's creativity gets timely for any number of reasons. Trauma, grief, illness, or just a few. But understanding where their creative cycles tend to start and where they break down during the process 
might offer us a clue as to how we can help them. I hope that viewing the cycle of creativity through the lens of this integrated method will stimulate ideas about how we might help nurture people's innate desire for expression and their longing for wholeness, unity, and transformation, and thus how to capture well-being in their creative moments. I'll conclude with these words by the Irish poet John O'Donoghue. When we are creative, we help the unknown to become known, the visible to be seen, and the rich darkness within us to become illuminated. Each one of us is in a state of perennial formation. Carried within the flow of time, you are coming to be who you are in every new emerging moment. Life is a journey that fills out your identity, and yet the true nature of a journey remains invisible. Inside each journey is a secret harvesting at work. It is as though the beginning of a journey offers the pilgrim a mirror where something is glimpsed, something that is beginning to form as an image. Over the course of the journey, the image fills and fills until finally at the end of the journey, the empty mirror has become a living icon of spirit. Thank you very much. Now, may we invite Dr. Nessu Yuki Nimoto to share with us on the messages from water. Dr. Nimoto received a Doctor of Science in Biology from the University of Tokyo in 1988. He worked in several universities in Japan, Miami, and Honolulu in the fields of biology and biotechnology. Since 2002, Dr. Emoto works as an international secretary for Dr. Masaru Emoto and has been researcher in the office Masaru Emoto for 10 years. Kaiho Thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Dr. Yasuyuki Nemoto, uh, secretary to Dr. Nemoto. Uh, first of all, uh, we thank uh, Ray Danilo and his family members who initiated this wonderful workshop series and for your giving us this wonderful opportunity. And however, uh, we are very sorry that uh, Dr. Emoto could not come here uh, because of his health condition. His travel uh, schedule was recently very hard and uh, while he was in Italy last month, uh, it was found that uh, he got a pneumonia and so he had to come back to Tokyo immediately. Uh, but after uh, he came to uh, office in Tokyo, uh, he has now uh, taken a good rest. So you don't need to worry about him. <laughs> and but still, uh, it is, uh, for him, it's very difficult uh, to go abroad. So uh, I came here on behalf of Dr. Emoto. And uh, by the way, my name is, uh, uh, my family name is Nemoto and not a motor. <laughs> and we don't have any biological connection. <laughs> Probably we have some spiritual connection. I don't know. <laughs> but so, uh, actually, the, I received a uh, doctor degree uh, from uh, University of Tokyo 
in the area of biology. So, and uh, I moved to Tokaimoto's uh, company, which is called IHM, uh, in the year of 2002. And since then, uh, I am working for Tokaimoto as his international secretary and uh, accompanying uh, him uh, for his lecture tour uh, in abroad. And also because uh, I am uh, only uh, I'm the only one who have a scientific background, so I I am studying the water research uh, from the viewpoint of science. But uh, let me say at the beginning the message from water or the water research at our company or Dr. Emoto is not yet on the state of science right now. So uh, when uh, I was listening to Carol's presentation, we are kind of moving from this thinking part to the intuition part. And Dr. Emoto is really a person of intuition. And uh, I'm a person of thinking. <laughs> and so uh, I found my role would be to fill in the gap between this type of thinking part or mental part and the intuition part. But uh, anyway, uh, today, so actually, uh, I am going to show you a special video message uh, of Dr. Emoto for you. And this video was made only for this symposium. And uh, its length is uh, 35 minutes. And he will talk about message from water, of course, and also his uh, philosophy on water. And uh, his most recent topic is uh, water and God. And uh, let me uh, change it. So this is uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Emoto and uh, myself uh, in London uh, just last month. And uh, so uh, you remember uh, very well uh, a super typhoon called Haiyan just hit the Philippines last week. And uh, some people are saying that uh, more than 10,000 people were killed. And disaster such as this typhoon or tsunami or flood or heavy rain are caused by water, of course. But uh, some people uh, say that even earthquake has something to do with water because uh, in the rocks under the ground contain water. And it, uh, our consciousness may have uh, something to do with the water under the ground, which may cause earthquakes. So, um, and also the, uh, in the end of this uh, video message, Dr. Emoto is uh, proposing a solution to avoid these disasters caused by water which is not a materialistic you know, a solution, but uh, probably it's a spiritual solution. But anyway, so please enjoy the video. Yes, the volume. 
But today, I want to speak about my new discovery concerning water and God. So, uh, maybe 30 minutes, I'll speak about this propaganda. <clears throat> So, so, uh, 
then examined inside our laboratory, where the temperature remains at a constant minus 5 degrees centigrade. Three hours later, we examined the tip of each ice block by illuminating it under a microscope. The crystals start to grow and expand as the temperature of the ice tip rises under the microscope. Usually, however, of the 50 ice blocks that we have to work with, only a few reveal their beautiful hexagonal crystals on camera. What kind of crystal will the water from Steinonokaki Falls show us?
because I started to work with Dr. Emoto since the year 2002, it was after Message from Water was published, and uh, uh, the staff who were involved in taking these photographs uh, already moved to other company or you know, other states, and so I made a contact with them, you know, three persons actually, and one of them actually wrote a book about his experience uh, in water crystal photography very recently about his uh, like more than um, uh, like 15 years ago experience and they say they did blind experiments which means uh, one of the staff printed the word you feel or thank you and you know, put the label onto the water and then after that, this person gave another person these two types of water. And this you know, another person did an experiment who didn't know which water is which. They repeated this several times. And I don't know really, but they found this kind of uh, result. It's not completely, you know, the water crystal is always changing. There are no identical images, of course like a snow flakes, but still there is some trend. At that time, it was significant. So after that uh, period, I joined the Taimoto's team, and now I try to repeat this experiment scientifically or statistically. Okay, so... <laughs> This is thank you in English, by the way. So very beautiful water crystal. This is you good in English. <laughs> uh, thank you in German. Danke. You good in German. Dunkop. <laughs> and this is uh, uh, so far the most beautiful water crystals which came from water, uh, which was shown to love and gratitude. This is Namaste, we show the word Namaste, the greeting in India, Angel, David, do it in a commando form, let's do it, much much better, mother cooking, very nice, instant food, what do you feel? Show you what the water saw. This is September 11, actually. Um, we showed uh, this label to the water. And this is the word, you are beautiful to the water. This is, uh, this is some special um, water uh, which we are giving to the children in Fukushima area, which got a uh, disaster, nuclear disaster. And this is the water crystal of this angel water. This is another you know, um, experiment which we show the innocence in Japanese to the water. And this uh, form is very similar to the angel water. And also, let me um, add one more topic here. I use my own. Uh, is uh, uh, Emoto Rice Experiment. And this is the uh, Emoto Rice Experiment. And uh, I think uh, this result is written in Message from Water, Volume 1. And what uh, they did was actually the, uh, the, a child of primary school did this experiment, which is uh, the parents, the father, prepared to cook the rice in the same glass container and uh, with lid. And uh, uh, the child, uh, every morning, told these two bottles, uh, this uh, right hand side, he said, thank you, always in the morning, thank you. Here, the label is shown, thank you in Japanese. And the uh, left side, 
uh, here is the label is uh, Yufuru in Japanese. And the child told this twice Yufu in Japanese every morning. And I, I found it's about uh, after three weeks or uh, one month. No, the difference was so big. And the uh, parents, the father, opened the lid and uh, he found from this right side, side you know, bottle, uh, he found a very nice smell, like a smell of fermentation. You know, very nice smell, <laughs> like a miso soup or something like that. And uh, this, uh, this side is, uh, it's rotten, bad smell. So different uh, with that they got. Uh, we interpreted this you know, because our intention or our energy affects probably uh, microbial uh, bacteria, uh, microorganisms, in both in the water or the water or both. And then we got this result. And I'll show you something. This is the key which is uh, sorry. And uh, here, actually, the, you can make uh, uh, research on Google or YouTube using the word Emoto Rice Experiments. And uh, on Google, I, this is a, as of yesterday, I checked. 33,400 Emoto Rice Experiments. And YouTube, three, more than 3,000 uh, results uh, on the internet. So you can check you know, if this is true or not. Or if you can perform the same experiment by your own. And this is an image search on Google using uh, rice experiment. So many people in the different countries are reproducing the result. This is very interesting. Okay. Okay. Then let me continue the video. Yeah. 
contract anymore, so I we apologize for the technical hiccup. We will now have a 15-minute Q&A session, so please raise your hand if you have any questions to ask our speakers, and our staff will pass the microphone to you, or alternatively, you can write your question on a piece of paper and pass it to our staff. of this university. Thank you, Dr. Cox and Dr. Emoto for your wonderful sharing. And before my questions, I would like to um, express my heartfelt gratitude to the host family for sharing and uh, sponsoring this event because um, just maybe 10 or 20 years ago, you will never have such open minds and eye-opening uh, discussions of stuff so non-scientific, so to speak, in um, in academic uh, world. Um, so I would like to thank the whole family again. I have a question for Dr. Emoto. Um, before the um, actual viewing of the water crystals on the microscope, you said um, during the process you actually shake the water a little bit to activate the water. So is it an uh, essential step of the whole process? I mean, is there any difference in the water crystals if you shake or if you do not shake the water? The reason why I ask is you always, um, so to speak, to potentize homeopathic remedy. It is an essential step to activate the um, remedy by shaking. And actually, the more rounds you shake, the remedy becomes more, more active in a way. So I would like to know, um, is that an essential step to shake? Yes, thank you for your question. And actually, the, uh, the standard process of water crystal photography, we always tap the water. Maybe you, uh, we showed in the video, maybe you missed the, that part, I'm not sure. But the researcher uh, actually tap the water to poten potentialize the water. And, but uh, this is standard procedure, so we always did that. But uh, recently, actually, uh, from the scientific background, I try to reproduce or uh, make uh, kind of uh, establish this uh, technology. And uh, I just started very recently, uh, like a few months ago. And so I'm not now in the process. And uh, but uh, I compared actually the water crystals uh, with tapping and without tapping. And in my case, uh, I didn't find any significant difference so far in my experiment. But uh, still, uh, I wonder because uh, there might be a group consciousness uh, is playing very big part on this uh, uh, water crystal technology. So I have to check more and more because it's just my own limited personal experience. So this is the current situation. Okay? My answer is good enough. Hello. Uh, I have a follow-up on the uh, Emoto Water Project. Um, Emoto got his uh, conclusion saying that the message is uh, water, uh, and then the wa wa water is the message, and then God is, water is God, or something like that. Um, I think he's very brave in jumping to that conclusion. But do you know why and how he makes such a statement? I think it is obvious 
a lot of people can use logic to challenge this conclusion. Can, can you say something? Yeah, I understand. Where are you? Over there? <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it's, um, he started to say this uh, philosophy very recently, I think uh, probably in April of this year or March. And uh, uh, I understand your point. And, but uh, his point, uh, uh, what I understand is uh, because uh, God was actually very near to us. And uh, so the water, because uh, our body, 70% is water. And uh, uh, God is also very near. It's, uh, water is like a God, but water is God, not one step further. And uh, so this is his way of thinking. And so maybe some people will not agree with this idea, or uh, theoretically, or, uh, but uh, um, we can understand that water is so important for us, like a God. So we have to recognize again the importance of water, like Dr. Emoto said in the video. So I understand that there is a possibility that some may object very strongly to him, but still he wanted to say it this way from his viewpoint. This is what uh, is my understanding. Um, thank you both for your very inspirational talks. I have a rather scientific question uh, directed to Dr. Nomoto. During your experiment, a lot of the specimens were discarded. Can I ask you the reason why that was the case? Because all the samples were taken from the same source, so surely the water should have made crystals in all the specimens. Where are you? Okay. Uh, your question is because uh, uh, Dr. Emoto is usually uh, showing one photograph from one water. But there should be a lot of uh, variety of water crystals in the sample. This is your point. Yeah. You want to know the reason? What? I just wanted to know the reason why so many samples were discarded. Discarded? Why? Yeah, because uh, I have, uh, as I said, I am uh, repeating the experiment and uh, Usually, uh, 50 water crystals we observe, or sometimes 100 or 200 from one water sample. And uh, uh, because uh, from the photograph, you may think that uh, you will get uh, 100 beautiful water crystals from one water sample, but this is not the case. Usually, we get uh, uh, at most 15 percent of uh, ice, we get the beautiful one. And other uh, water crystals we didn't uh, put on the book, like a uh, from water. And uh, this is uh, because uh, I'm a scientist, so at the beginning I had the same kind of same question about this, because we, we should show all the crystals, all the photographs from one sample. This is a scientific a statistic, a analysis and also scientific way. I try to do this. And uh, still, uh, because, uh, for example, just one uh, result from my own experience, I put the uh, crystal quartz, you know the quartz, uh, into tap water. And I compared just tap water and tap water with quartz. And uh, in the case of tap water, um, the beautiful crystal is very rare, especially like uh, uh, 20 years ago, Tokyo tap water was worse than now. <laughs> now it's becoming more beautiful. I mean, uh, we could observe a few uh, water crystals from 50 samples. But I compared the result from tap water and tap water with quartz crystal, then uh, I found no beautiful water crystals from tap water, just a broken one, like three broken ones from 50 sub water crystals. But from the uh, water with crystal, 
I found one quite beautiful, nice water crystal and two other not so beautiful, but still some beautiful water crystal. So the difference is very uh, not deep, probably. And so uh, I have to, you know, pursue statistically. This um, result is just uh, by chance, or is, is there any statistical meaning? This is my you know, uh, work right now. So please understand we are now in the process <laughs> about science. Thank you for your question. And then the far back. Um, Professor Coates, I have two questions to ask. Yeah, my, my name is Dorinda. Thank you. Thank you. The first question is because just now I saw in the circle there was four seasons. And I wonder if a being born in a different season would have affected their development? And the second one is what if uh, being born in between the seasons, like for example if he or she born in summer and spring or winter or autumn in between the differences of weather will they affect it, the development? That's a really good question. I'm afraid I'm not qualified to answer it, but uh, but it would be a good hypothesis to, to perhaps study. I mean, if, if people believe that the, in astrology perhaps when you're born in the season makes sense as well. I don't know. I have, it's, not, it's not something I have investigated. Thank you. Thank you. And um, our last question will go to the lady. Uh, hello. Um, actually, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Imoto the question. And I would like to thank for Dr. Imoto first because he was in C and still prepared the uh, insightful PowerPoint whatsoever. And follow up to questions about the conclusion from the message from water. As Dr. Emoto, Emoto said that water is God, but I would like to ask more about what God is he mean to? Because I remember Emoto mentioned that he said he can study well or interpret well about water because he believed he has studied in his past lives. It made me associate about Buddhism saying. And also during the presentation, um, um, actually doctors are using different kind of language to deliver the message to the water. And this is all about the human saying. We humans say and speak to the water eventually the water changed. So I'm curious if Dr. Imoto concluded water is gone, why don't we conclude that water is alive as we humans all create message and everything to make consequence no matter good or bad, just like if we say uh, you fool or thank you, and that eventually we have a better server. Um, this is all maybe related to Buddhism as well, because from his presentation and his saying, it's like in Buddhism, it like he treat everything, you know, no kill the animals whatsoever. So what I feel when in, in Dr. Imoto present water that way is simply like very humanly takes way. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand your question very well, but the first point is uh, what uh, does Dr. Dr. Imoto think God is? Or, uh, and um, my understanding is actually uh, I have to ask Dr. Imoto directly to answer to your question, but uh, uh, it was, as I said, that in this year, uh, very recently, he came to this conclusion. And before that, uh, he didn't say, he's, he's saying that the water is a messenger from God. But he didn't say water is God. But I think, uh, as I said, uh, he thinks, uh, 
he respects water very much, like uh, you know, we respect God. Or he wants people, other people to respect the water in a similar way. So in this, uh, to, I don't know, to ask the people to you know, respect the water, he, he started to say the water is God. And actually, in his uh, mind or uh, in his heart, he's really thinking that the water is God. So this is what I can say uh, about this question. And another point is just uh, I don't know, but uh, there is an experiment that uh, we show the words to the water. And in this case, um, you may have some question that if this is really the effect of God itself. And Dr. Taimoto's answer is. Uh, he thinks this is not just the world, but also the consciousness of human beings involved in this experiment. And uh, I said we did a blind experiment, which means uh, nobody actually knew what the you know, level was or what kind of water actually. But still, in this case, like group consciousness, we knew some information. Because some people know this part of this experiment, and other people know that part of the experiment. As a whole, we knew the whole information, kind of. So, uh, anyway, we think uh, ultimately that our human consciousness is working on this experiment. Thank you. Okay, so in the wake of time, I'm afraid we have to end our Q&A session here. But please join me once again to thank Professor Cox and Dr. Nimoto. you guys today for joining the annual symposium of the Danny D.B. Hill workshop series in holistic therapy. It's been a pleasure to meet all of you and of course to learn from our speakers. And if you're interested in attending Dr. Nimoto's workshop on November 15th and 16th, there are still limited seats left so don't miss it. And don't forget to check out our website and Facebook page for more upcoming events. But before you leave, um, there is a feedback form in your package. Please take a moment to fill it out and give us some comments.